I'd like to thank you for t attending today's docu-series, Letters of Hope. Uh, welcome to everyone in the room, and welcome to everyone participating on our live stream feed. At TDX, our mission is to provide groundbreaking services to enable our customers around the world to help improve the lives of transplant recipients and their caregivers. To fulfill this mission, we need to do more than just listen to stories. We need to actively engage the entire transplant community. That includes recipients, donors, caregivers, those on the wait list. We need to make sure we understand their perspectives, their experiences, and their challenges. We have a responsibility as the world's leading provider of innovative transplant diagnostics to incorporate this understanding into what we do every day. This will enable us to continue to have a positive and significant impact on transplant recipients. Thermo Fisher is very proud to sponsor the Letters of Hope docu-series featuring our patient consultant advocate, Valen Kiefer. Today's screening and panel discussion allows us the opportunity to learn more about the communities we serve and how we can work together to improve transplant outcomes. As the president of our Transplant Diagnostics Division, I am thrilled to share this screening experience with you, and I am honored to introduce the creative force behind Letters of Hope, Valen Kiefer. Thank you so much, Nicole. Hi, everyone, and hello to all of you who are joining via live stream. I'm so excited for today's event, and it means a lot to have all of you a part of the official release of our Letters of Hope docuseries. I've spent half of my life as a transplant recipient. For my first transplant, I was provided little to no resources and didn't know anyone else going through a similar experience. For my second transplant, I received a binder of information and attended a support group where someone got ill twice during the meeting, and I left scared thinking that that was going to potentially be my future. With this in mind, I wanted to create a patient-to-patient -patient resource that I wish I had navigating this transplant journey from diagnosis to post-transplant care. I've tried to package my experiences in an honest and vulnerable way to address issues impacting our community. There are many chapters to transplantation. It is a lifelong journey and can be overwhelming. So that is why I wanted to break it down into 12 topic-based segments. So depending on what stage you're in, you can pick a topic digest it, come back to another one when you're ready to watch more. This can be an intimate experience, watching it alone or with your family and friends. I also designed it so you can enjoy the whole docu-series like we're going to be doing today. My hope is that this will educate, inspire, and empower the transplant community. I'd like society at large to gain new insight and in turn have more empathy and be able to provide better support to those in need. I hope that the medical field will have a better understanding of what us patients are going through and that these segments will spark meaningful conversations and hopefully lead to positive change within our community. This Saturday marks my 20th kidney transplant anniversary. Being <laughs> Being a patient advocate is a really important part of my life. I'm so grateful for Thermo Fisher for believing in patient advocacy and affording me this opportunity to channel all that I've endured and learned these past 20 years into creating this evergreen resource for our community. I believe the impact and power of storytelling has no bounds. Our stories connect one another. They inspire us, they give us hope, and they make us feel not alone. I hope after hearing my letters of hope, that you will be encouraged to write your own. I'm thrilled to now introduce Letters of Hope.
When you find out that you need a transplant, it's just really scary and overwhelming. It never comes at a great time in life. That's not how receiving a diagnosis works. And I've been in your shoes of being so scared and feeling alone and wondering what your future is like and if you're going to have restored health again. I think that we need to be kind to ourselves and give ourselves time to process the news. Change can be really hard on people. And when you get a diagnosis and you know that you're going to be different and there are gonna be new normals throughout the way, I think the gravity of it can be really devastating. I underestimate the power of ourselves mentally and physically. And I think that we underestimate how well we can adapt to change. I've been living with kidney disease for almost 30 years. I've been a transplant recipient for half of my life. When I was a child, I couldn't see a future for myself. I didn't know anyone that was living a life that was joyful post-transplant. I went through my whole youth with many questions, feeling alone and no support except from my parents. And now as an adult, experiencing what it's like having a community and a circle of support around me, it's night and day. When you're around people that get it, that truly get it, that you can talk about lab numbers, you can talk about the emotions of this journey, you really don't feel alone in it. And life can surprise us because I never imagined that I would be healthy and well after receiving two transplants. And I think that's where hope comes into the picture because we don't know the good from this. We know that challenges will come and that we have to endure a lot when going through a transplant, but there's things that can surprise us along the way. Like we can be surprised by how strong we are and all that we can endure. And if we hold on to that hope of the good that can come through all of this, it makes the journey a lot easier. And sometimes having that hope just helps us get to the next day. Receiving a transplant isn't a cure, it's a lifelong journey. And I've been fortunate to get to that other side and be able to experience life post-transplant. And I'm in awe every day by how transformative this journey has been. And my wish for you is that with a sense of hope and surrounding yourself with a wonderful community of others going through the same thing, that you too can live a fulfilling and joyful life post-transplant. Polycystic kidney disease goes back as far as five generations in our family. Growing up, I had no voice. <laughs> I didn't know anyone else going through our disease except knowing my mom had it and I had family members that passed away. But the unique thing is we didn't even talk about it within our family. It's mm -hmm. like I got sick and we dealt with it. As a child, finding my voice could have been if I just saw someone else that was going through the same thing, and that could have made me not feel alone. Absolutely. So there's different levels of finding your voice, whether it's seeing commonalities in somebody else, whether it's the ones that are actually standing up on a stage and advocating for the community as a whole. And I think no matter what level it is, there's importance to it. when things appeared because they did. I, I can't describe how devastated I was. In our adolescent years and teenage years, I'd find we'd go to doctor's visits and the doctor would say, well, how is she? And I'm like, well, and then I'd explain how she is. Like you'd sit there mm -hmm. and then, or even if the doctor how are you? She'd go, mm -hmm. like, mom, go ahead, a answer for me. She was my mom, my friend and took on the caregiver role. I was still the person that answered the questions, um, took the notes for the, her medicines and everything. And your and dad, I, you know, he's, he's a rock. Absolutely. 
she got her voice from right after she got her transplant. And when uh, a nurse came in, and she told Valen the, the medicines to take. And, and I'm like, okay, what's that? And what's that? And she's like, uh, no, no, uh, this isn't, this is Valen. If she wants to succeed with this, it's, it's your role. I actually trusted her because she was by this time on board and she was absolutely ready to handle it. Now I feel Noah being my caregiver, it's more of a partnership because I'm an active member. And I, I think sometimes finding your voice could be as simple as seeing yourself in someone else. Meeting others that walk in your shoes, about to go through what you are, the comfort in that is huge. Just that you feel seen and heard and see somebody that's post-transplant and say, okay, if she can do it, I can do it. And that in itself can give you hope. A young York County woman has spent most of her life struggling with an incurable kidney disease. Now her story is being told. Valen Kiefer, she's a patient advocate. Valen Kiefer, she's had not one but two organ donations. Finding her voice doesn't necessarily mean it's speaking and sharing. I think it can come out in other beautiful ways. For me, I learned of my love of writing, and that has become so therapeutic. I've seen many in the community who paint and draw and do all kinds of art, and that's just a time for us to escape in a healthy way and get to a positive place and separate ourselves from all that we endure. It's almost like we have this, this pent-up experiences and, and challenges and these emotions that build up that it's like we don't know what to do with them so they need to come out and we have that choice we can take these dark challenging times and we can turn them into something meaningful and beautiful and help other people you know whether that's finding our voice to share it with just one individual to help them on their journey or many individuals or create something beautiful I think there's a lot of opportunities to do it and it doesn't have to be on a large visual scale it can be small and intimate. Advocating for yourself can feel like a full-time job sometimes. You're dealing with your sickness and your appointments and your normal day-to-day -day life of cleaning your house and making dinner. And when you're navigating all of this, you're doing this a lot of the times not feeling well. And it's hard to find the energy to do everything. Advocating for yourself is speaking up, knowing your body, explaining how you feel explaining the importance of certain care that you need. When I go to the emergency room, I advocate for myself by having a spreadsheet that lists out all of my medicines and allergies and surgeries. Having tools like that to be able to help others understand my health history really quickly when I'm in an emergency state. And when we meet a doctor or a nurse for the first time and we're in critical need of of emergent care, it's really important for us to be able to be confident to share what we go through in our condition with other people because we've lived this journey for so long. We know it best. We know how we feel. We know how our body has handled certain instances. Like when I had repeat sepsis episodes, I knew how my body would respond to that. And it was important for me to be vocal and be able to share that with the doctors caring for me of this is what happened in the past and this is how I usually respond to it. And they can't predict that when they're just meeting us for the first time. And I can tell you from personal experience how important it is for us to listen to our gut and follow our intuition. There's been instances where I just had a feeling something wasn't right. One of them was when a nurse was changing the bag on my IV pole and the room was dark, she left, and I just had a feeling something wasn't right. So I told my parents to turn the lights on and they turned the lights on and my IV tube wasn't primed. And if I didn't follow that gut and take action on it, there could have been severe consequences that I would have had to deal with. When I was really sick and kept getting repeat sepsis infections, we were doing tests after tests and we just couldn't find the root cause of them. It got to a point where I had suggested getting a PET scan done. That was the, one of the only big tests that wasn't done yet. And everyone said that usually is only when 
they think you have cancer. And I kept saying, well, let's just try it. And it was my intuition that we needed to just try something else and that determination to just keep going. And eventually the PET scan was approved and the PET scan results showed that my liver lit up. And that's what led us down the path of looking into my liver, which was the root cause of my sepsis infections. And if I didn't listen to that inner voice and follow my gut and really push and be an advocate for myself, it could have taken longer or we might never have found the reason for my repeat sepsis episodes. So I think just hanging on to that and not giving up, even if it takes a while to convince others to listen to you or even believe what you say, our voice, our patient voice is so important in this journey because it's our path. We live it. We understand it better than anyone else. And it's important for us to just continue to speak up. For transplant evaluation, the time frame of it can vary, but for us, it was a two day long experience, about 10 hours each day, appointment after appointment, starting first thing in the morning. You're getting evaluated to see if you're sick enough to need a transplant and well enough to be able to endure the surgery. And this whole time that you're going through it, you're severely ill. When I found out that I needed a life-saving liver transplant, when my hepatologist gave her number one suggestion of moving out of state for transplant, I instantly said, we can't do that. How can we do that? Like at the time I'm severely ill and to think of just uprooting our lives, moving out of state, it seemed so huge, so impossible. Yeah, at, at this point, we're balanced health is to the point where she is very ill walking down to the to get the mail at the mailbox is a, is a big task and her team throws this option on her to relocate to St. Louis and we just don't know how we're going to be able to do this. As a caregiver, you're looking for the best option, the, the best possible outcome for your loved one. And so when she told me that the best option would be to relocate, you're in this state of you have two choices. Fight and do everything you can or give up and that wasn't an option for us and it blew my mind because in that moment I had this almost sense of relief taken off my shoulders and the power of support and what caregivers can give us has so much value I think more than they even understand and it was that moment that our journey began towards looking into getting dual listed potentially temporarily relocating and having hope to maybe have restored health and a second chance at life. I encourage you to search out the best options. If that's getting dual listed, finding the best location for you to hopefully have the best outcome and receive a transplant as soon as possible. With this journey, it's really challenging to have so many things out of your control and trying to focus on the things that you can control is so helpful. Being as organized as you can leading into transplant evaluation, as you wait for the call, as you hope that you get listed and find out that you can receive your life-saving transplant, it makes us feel like we do have some say in what's going on. We can help the outcome of what's going to be in our future and that helps keep us grounded through the whole process. What I always find interesting about growing up with health issues is that I don't think I ever expected to find someone like Noah to be able to step up and, and join in on this journey. Because as you hear when we talk, we say we. Like I even say when we got a liver transplant because it feels like we did <laughs> because he was there every step of the way. And I think that exemplifies the power of a patient and caregiver partnership in this journey. 
I feel extremely lucky to be able to not only have had great parents to care for me and help keep me alive and keep me going, but now having Noah as a caregiver, there's so many things that he brings to the table. He gives me something to look forward to. And I think when you're when you're sick, you need that joy. And even when you're healthy and on the other side of transplant, you need still that forward thinking of positivity because you know things can come up. Really, you know, the caregiver role is, is one that's always in place. I mean, it, it really starts at the moment of, of diagnosis. And from there, from an official role, as, as your loved one, as the patient has more health hiccups, more hurdles to overcome, and you really have to start to fill in a little bit. You have to start to help them advocate for themselves, to help speak out on their behalf, to make sure that they're getting the care that they need. You might answer kind of how they're feeling, how they're doing day to day. The patient might be like, I'm doing fine. They might not realize that they're starting to slow down a little bit, that they're starting to be in pain more often or withdraw a little bit more. And you're that independent voice that can say, well, actually, remember, you forgot where your keys were or that you couldn't go get the mail the other day. Having that perspective and giving the, the reality of the situation to the healthcare team is a really important one. It can be really hard as a patient to be navigating being sick and receiving all the support without feeling like a burden or having guilt associated with it. Being 39 years old and us navigating health issues now for many, many years, there are times that, of course, I wish I was 30-some without any health issues, would be able to have children and lead a life like that and give Noah what I think he deserves. And those are emotions that are really hard for me to navigate at times. And I have to go through trying to be confident and tell myself that I didn't do anything to cause these issues that I have and just know that I deserve love and care. And I think it's important for all of us to know that and that we need to lean into the fact that we need support. And when we do need it, to speak up and ask for it and be willing to accept it. And that's been very hard for me to do. Yeah, and that, that's an ongoing life lesson or an ongoing progression of, of being somebody that has a chronic illness is being able to admit that you need care and accept care. And I know, Valen, it's something that we've struggled with as, as a team. And there's times where I want you to do less and you want to do more because you're trying to take some ownership of your of your care. But like you said, and like I've, you and I have talked many times, this isn't something that you had done to yourself. This is, you know, a disease that has caused this issue. And, you know, there's, there's nothing you could have done to prevent it. And in a relationship, I think you go through those times of where I think he deserves better. And that's just so terrible to think of yourself and put that emotion on yourself with everything else that you're navigating. And it's not easy to sit there and be so sick that you can't do the things and then you watch him taking on more and more tasks. And like I tell Valen, I mean, you know, that's my role. I, I signed up for in sickness and in health and that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm here to help you do this. And you have to realize your limitations as a, as a patient and ask for help from, from your caregiver so that you actually don't add more stress to the situation. I think that's why this is a team effort. Yeah. Even though he's a caregiver caring for me, it's important for patients to then know that they need to care for the caregiver as well. That's, that's a necessary thing to do because me as a caregiver, your loved one is, is fighting this, this battle and you want to be there to be a champion for them, even if it's just to hold their hand. And the reality of the situation is you can't care for somebody if you're not at least caring a little bit for yourself. But in that moment, you're blind to that. And you need that other person to say, look, go get yourself something to eat. You're not looking so good. Like, you know, go just relax, hang out. I'm where I need to be. I'm, I'm around the people I need to be around. Showing gratitude to your caregiver is not only important thanking them verbally, but also in the way that you take care of yourself and the choices you make every day. Because that really shows how grateful you are for all the hard work that you've done together. And showing them that you can live a good quality of life is a beautiful way to thank them. Yeah. <laughs>
When you're in need of a life-saving organ transplant, the wait list is something that we all deal with. You sit and wait in limbo for the call. When you're on the wait list, you're in need of a life-saving organ. So you're in a very fragile state of health. Some people can sit on the list for a week or several years. From my experience, I was so sick that I remember a day where I called my healthcare team to remind them of how poorly I felt because I just wasn't sure I would survive much longer. During that time frame, you have such a close connection with the possibility of death, knowing that you're in a stage that if you don't receive a new organ, you're not going to survive. I wasn't the strong wife anymore that I wanted to be, and I would strive to walk around the grocery store with my husband Noah, and I was so sick that it got to a point that I couldn't do that anymore. And I'd have to lay in the car while he grocery shopped, and it was so hard for me to stop doing things like that. A moment I'll never forget is when I got to a point where Noah would be talking to me and he asked me a question and I felt so exhausted that I felt like I didn't even have the energy to answer his question and communicate with him. And at that point I thought, I just don't know if I'm going to survive. I don't know if I'm gonna make it to receive the call. And that's a really scary place to be. And it's not just waiting for that call, but wondering what all is connected to that. Will I get a transplant? Would I ever be a strong wife again? Would I ever be healthy? You just have all of these questions going through your mind every day and that limbo, that wondering if you're going to make it to the next day, make it to get the call is such a challenging space to be in. You feel like everybody else's world is continuing on and yours is just standing still waiting for somebody to save your life waiting in a sense for an organ to become available, which means that someone has to pass away in order for that to happen. Those are really hard emotions. I think you need to separate yourself and realize that someone isn't dying for you to survive, but it's somebody that their journey, they're passing away and they made a decision they said yes to organ donation so that they can save other people's lives when they pass on. And I think looking at it from that perspective helps because there's a lot of people that endure survivor's guilt. My husband and I, we would still try and find some type of joy in every day and some type of connection to reality in the outside world because we felt so disconnected at this time. We were just kind of suspended, waiting for hopefully something to happen to continue our lives. We knew that in order for our lives to continue forward and for me to get healthier and us to have any type of future together would be for me to receive a liver transplant. We found a sweet little coffee shop that we really loved and we would try and go there when I was feeling well enough. And I remember that week before transplant, my phone is next to me at all times. I had a little carrying case that I would carry it with me all the time so it wouldn't be in my purse so I wouldn't miss a call. I mean, that's how important it is. If you miss the call, you miss the transplant. And I remember saying to family and friends, don't call me. <laughs> I didn't want my phone to ring and have it be anybody else but the call. So that's how vital this time period is in the transplant journey. You're just so relying on your phone to ring. But if we could get a moment or two each day, a healthy escape to bring a little bit of peace to ourselves, it was helpful. I don't know that we were successful in doing it every day, but I know that these small moments helped just let us breathe for a moment and give us some hope and to just trust the process and that everything would be okay. And it was good for us to get out, to get some fresh air, to feel like our world was normal when it was the furthest from normal than it's ever been. And I think being able to have that healthy escape was really helpful for us.
receiving the call is a rush like no other. You've worked so hard, the anticipation, you're waiting and to actually get that call. We got it at 1 a.m. I answered the phone and my transplant coordinator said, we found the perfect liver for you. We checked in and sat down and that's where it all began. Kind of go through a, another mini pre transplant evaluation, making sure that you are strong enough to survive the coming surgery. After a couple hours, somebody comes in and says, okay, the organ's here. We're gonna move you down to pre-op. We go down there, a whole other flurry of activity happens, nurses in and out, poking, prodding, getting IV lines in. And literally a thumbs up, thumbs down from my surgeon could change our future. All of a sudden, the nurse came around gave the thumbs up and it was go time. And I remember her wheeling me off and going to turn the corner and I hear her say, you got it. I hear her say, do you wanna say bye to your husband one more time? And those moments are really hard because then you do wonder if it's the one more time or the last time. So I remember he came running down the hallway. I really just, let go and trusted and just hoped that I would wake up on the other side. I always had this feeling that if I could just wake up after surgery and see Noah that everything would be okay. Remember I was in the operating room and it's quiet and all I'm doing is watching everybody intently doing their job and I'm thinking, okay, this is happening. So I said out loud, everybody's feeling positive today, right? <laughs> And um, everybody kind of smiles. And then a nurse came over to me and she looked at me directly in my eyes and said, we all love what we do and we all love being here. So my first memory after transplant is waking up and all of a sudden the first thing I see are silhouettes of my dad and Noah walking in the hallway to enter the room. And I thought, no way, I did it. The double doors swing open, there she is awake, not intubated, looks fantastic for just going through one of the biggest surgeries your body can endure. And there she is looking around the room and <laughs> she sees her dad and I. So I had a tube down my nose that made me not be able to talk. So I tried as hard as I could and wanted to communicate. So I was writing stuff and I drew three stick people to represent Noah, me and dad. And I put, this is all I had wished for. <laughs> I've been through a lot of operations to know that when they sit you up, which they try and get you to move and walk as soon as possible, that's your start to recovery. Just those first steps, which are so hard and painful, and it didn't take long until I had to sit down again. That's the moment of recovery and moving forward. When you see that you've woken up, you're well enough to move again. And that was really exciting. That was healing. The first time I saw my scar after liver transplant, mm -hmm. that took my breath away. My body really transformed because I was super swollen that I looked pregnant. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is my new liver baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you just have to like roll with things and realize that you're gonna have transformations of yourself physically and mentally after the surgery and just knowing that time will heal. It's your critical mm -hmm. healing and recovery when you're in the hospital. And then once you get released, you go back to clinic twice a week. You get labs twice a week. You take, you take vitals every hour. You're taking meds, you're recording weights, temperatures, blood yep. pressure, caring for the incision. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was our big thing because nothing can derail a, a, a successful recovery like an infection. The big thing for us was again, trying to control these pieces that we could try to control, to feel empowered in, in her health and in her recovery. It's amazing because life just continues to go on. We worked so hard throughout this transplant journey to stay well, get us to the next step, closer to transplant, it's important for us to be able to trust our healthcare team and trust the process and 
know when we have to work really hard and then know when we have to just let go and put it in the hands of our surgeons and doctors and nurses. Receiving a new organ and becoming a transplant recipient is a gift that comes with a whole new set of responsibilities because now you are embarking on a lifelong journey of being immunosuppressed. I think what's challenging living immunosuppressed is that we look healthy, but that doesn't equal how well we're doing or how we respond to things. And it comes with responsibilities and new normals that we have to navigate. When you receive a transplant, it is a new organ and a foreign object in your body. So we have to take immunosuppression medicine to suppress our immune system so that our bodies don't reject the organ that we just received. But that comes with not being able to fight off colds and illness as well. I can get more sick than I would if I wouldn't be taking this medicine and wouldn't have a transplant. Also living immunosuppressed, you're at a heightened risk of skin cancer. So I wear sunscreen every day and every six months I get a full skin body check for skin cancer. Our whole world and how we respond to things completely change and we have to respond differently in the way that we care for ourselves and the decisions that we make because of having a suppressed immune system. Another important part is for us to embrace that this is our new world. And a big part of this is for us to take ownership and speak up and be okay with this transition in our life and know the importance of us advocating for ourselves every day. Even though some days it can feel exhausting to continue to ask if somebody is sick before you go over to their house or to have to re-explain to a family member or friend that you just think by now they should know and understand. Being immunosuppressed and navigating COVID has been really, really tough for our community. We started out not knowing if the vaccine was safe or effective for our community, and it hasn't been as effective for transplant recipients. Now more than ever, it has been important for us to take the best care of ourselves and not jeopardize the health that you have. I take pills three times a day, around 20 total per day. Two of the medicines is anti-rejection. I also have epilepsy, so that's some of the medicine. And when you have a transplant, sometimes other complications come from it. I have high blood pressure from my polycystic kidney disease and take medicine for that as well. So it's a variety. There's some anti-rejection and there's other pills that come along with receiving a transplant like supplements and things for my overall health. I mean, these pills are vital for our transplant, the longevity of our transplants, and it doesn't limit your quality of life in the sense of travel. For me, I'm really organized before we go out in our RV and go anywhere. I have individual pill cases for every day because if I don't have my medicine, I can't go anywhere. It is vital. You, It's something that's a part of every day and it's the big component of what's keeping you alive. I know heading into transplant, it can seem really overwhelming to navigate all the medicine, know the checkups that you have to do, but it just becomes a part of your life. And I look at it as an opportunity that I have to take the best care of myself and show my gratitude for this second chance and gift of life that I've been given. When you're starting to date someone or you're married and get diagnosed and find out that you need a transplant, the sooner you can have open conversations, the better. It connects you in a special way to be able to do this as a partnership. Being so open and vulnerable can seem like something scary to do, but it can lead to something beautiful. And even if it doesn't at that very moment, you're giving yourself the opportunity to hopefully get to that point of being with somebody that you're supposed to be with. The way that Valen and I met was through a mutual friend that kind of took us along to a place where her and I first laid eyes on each other. He asked me, can I buy... Hey, can I get you a drink? And I said, 
No thanks. I had a kidney transplant. Yelling it over the music. He was like, hey, because <laughs> how do you respond to that? And when he first called me, he's like, hey, you know, naturally, like, what are you up to? And I was like, oh, I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm going to speak to the National kidney Congressional kidney, kidney, kidney Caucus tomorrow. And she told me, yeah, I'm not your average girl. So, <laughs> so if I hadn't known that already, I found that out really quickly on. At the time, I was several years post-kidney transplant, and I was thriving. I was so healthy. I was working full-time. I really found my passion of being a patient advocate. It wasn't even like he looked at me differently. It wasn't as if I had anything or any health issues. It's just something I shared with you about my life, and there was no hesitation about any of it. Six months after being together, he took me out here to California, and we planned and saved for two years and decided that we wanted to move cross-country. What she didn't know is that before we left for our cross-country trip, I had asked her dad's permission to marry her. And in asking that, he looked me squarely in the eye, made sure that I knew that Valen was kind of at the healthiest point that he had ever seen her in her life, and that there might be other dark days that, that come, and really just making sure that this was the commitment that I wanted to make and that I was sure and steadfast in my conviction to do it, and I was. You get diagnosed with something, you instantly think, how do I tell somebody that I'm dating? Or how do I tell somebody that I'm married to that I'm going to need a transplant? And am I going to have kids? Am I going to have a family? Like, these are the real life thoughts that we have when we find out that something is going to impact our lives like transplantation. And to, to have those conversations and be honest about what this whole journey might look like is really needed. It's, it's just open, honest conversation because it's going to be difficult. It's going to make the journey that much more sweet, but that much more difficult. I think there was only one doctor in this entire journey that sat us down, looked us both square in the eye and said, is having a child important to you? Mm. Because if it's important to you, we'll figure it out and we'll make it happen. There are a lot of people that just really wanna be mothers. They're very passionate about that. And that's a really hard thing to go through, to think that you might not be one or that you can or it won't work out. and navigating those emotions are so challenging. If this is something that you really want, I believe that there is a way. No matter what we're going through, I think we should still strive to seek the life that we really want to lead. And I believe with our determination, our healthcare team, the support from the community, I think a lot's possible. I think the nice thing with being upfront with somebody is that you can learn if they're a good fit for you. If you're honest and you share what you're going through or what you're going to go through in the future and you can see that it's just too much for them, then you know that that's not the right fit for you. And that's okay. As hard as that may be, you wanna find that right person. You deserve that person and that there are the right fit and people out there to care for you and share this journey with you. On our transplantation journeys, we are bound to hit some bumps in the road. There are additional unforeseen health complications. I like to call them health hiccups. And the more equipped we are to handle them when they pop up, the less they will derail us. Often on our transplant journey, we can endure hiccups that are related to our transplant or other health issues entirely. After my recovery from kidney transplant, I did well for many years. When all of a sudden I started to get sick again and found out that my PKD had affected my liver and I needed a second transplant, my family and I were devastated. We were blown away that I needed a liver transplant on top of a kidney transplant. The reality is that it might not just be our transplants that we have to deal with. I navigate being a transplant recipient, epilepsy, and chronic pain from scoliosis. Sometimes one of those things almost gets put to the side and I can't even take good care of it when something else is heightened. Through these health challenges, some of my health hiccups can be small, like my blood pressure can drop really low, or I could have a seizure. It has been such a variety of health hiccups, but regardless of their size, they feel very significant. 
I remember when I needed my first liver biopsy after transplant. It is quite straightforward, but for me, I was so concerned that it was my transplanted liver and that it wouldn't have bleeding and I had all these questions and it was such a challenging experience because of what I have been through leading up to it. And I think a lot of times we have to be kind on ourselves that even if it seems small, it's okay if to us we're navigating all of the emotions of it feeling like it has a huge impact on us. But I think the sooner we can learn how to be prepared for health hiccups and then how to handle them and be able to move on from them quickly really helps put it in perspective and get through these inevitable little blips that will happen in our health journey. With health hiccups, I think it's good to take them on day by day. And even though we know that there's likely more challenges to come, not to focus on that and get stressed or overwhelmed that we're gonna have to deal with more things in the future. Now I'm used to them that when my blood pressure starts to plummet, I know I need to lay down in a couple hours it will pass and then I carry on with my day. We all find positivity and hope in different ways. For me personally, I take it one step at a time and find something in every day that brings me joy, whether that's going out in nature, spending time with my husband, having a community to talk to, having a circle of support has really been important my wish for you is that you're able to stay close to the people that provide you support and happiness and find things that bring you joy through health hiccups that you may endure because most of them do pass. In the transplant community, one thing that we all have in common is our scars. But the scars that we don't talk about enough are the scars on the inside, the ones we can't see. So it's especially important for our community to shine a light on mental health. When you're receiving a transplant, you're assigned a transplant coordinator, but you're not assigned a resource or someone to go to for counseling, support for what you're going through. You're told that resources are available, but you have to take the action versus having the support provided and making it easier for you. This is a topic that isn't always easy for people to talk about. And it's not just for the recipient ourselves. I think it's for our care system as well, for our caregivers, those who support us like family and friends. I remember having a conversation with my mother-in-law when I was getting close to receiving a liver transplant. I was on the wait list, wondering if I was gonna get the call and survive. And I asked my mother-in-law if she thought that Noah was thinking that I was going to die. When you face death, it's inevitable that you're going to look at life differently, that you're going to have things to process that you may never be able to fully process. I think part of transplant evaluation should be an appointment with a therapist, a counselor to discuss what you're going through. This is a life and death situation and it would really make a difference in how we're able to navigate the journey, recover, and the quality of life that we could live post-transplant. When I was young and I'd see other people without any scars, I'd think back to when my back didn't have any scars or my abdomen didn't. And I think it's important for us not to look back on our journey and look forward on it. And because of these scars, we're able to have a future and look forward to things. I was the young person that was ashamed of my body, and now I'm proud of what my body has been able to go through. It's important for us to be proud of who we are, proud of what we've been able to endure and overcome, and embrace this as a beautiful part of our health challenges. It's completely normal to feel scared and overwhelmed and confused about your future when you're heading into transplant, post-transplant, the long journey of living immunosuppressed. Group sessions are really impactful because we can share experiences, find common ground with other people, seeing the commonalities between us, the variety of our journeys, and how many people have gone through similar things, and how many people are doing well and living a good quality of life post-transplant. And these type of conversations really help us navigate the hard times and give us hope to keep moving forward. Sometimes we have to come up with ways on our own to cope. 
For me, before liver transplant, every morning I'd listen to the same song and I'd visualize myself healthy and happy. And that gave me something to look forward to and something to work towards. The truth is on this lifelong journey, we have to deal with questions and concerns our entire life. Like how long will this organ last? Will I need another transplant? And it's important for us to be able to be comfortable to really share what this journey is like and embrace the things that we have to deal with. And I think that's the importance of us being open about it and having people that will listen and understand to help normalize what we've been through and help give us comfort and that there's a purpose to this journey and a bigger picture and reason for all of what we're going through. I am blown away every day to still be alive. It's still amazing to try and grasp that because of two selfless organ donors, I sit here today extremely healthy and happy and their gifts restored my health and have enabled me to live the second half of my life. I met my kidney donor, Sally, when I was in eighth grade, and when she found out that I was really sick, she stepped forward and got tested to be a donor. She felt a calling and like she was the one, and she wound up being an extraordinary match, and we would have never imagined her gift would have led to me still being alive at 39 years old today. It's just extraordinary the people that do this that selflessly give of themselves to give someone else a better life i try and show sally my gratitude through action by the way i choose to live my life the way i strive to help other people and really just live the fullest life i can and we recently went on an RV trip and I was texting her on the way, telling her what we were doing and was excited to be going and seeing new things because I can do those things because of her. And it's amazing to continually be able to show her how impactful her decision and her gift has been. We get asked questions a lot in life. And when you think of going to the DMV and one of the questions you get asked is, would you like to be an organ donor? Check yes or no. There's a person out there that checked yes and chose to be an organ donor. And because of their decision, you have something as precious as a second chance and a gift of life. It's a whole other set of emotions to receive a deceased donation like I did with my liver. I don't know who they are. I don't know who my donor family is but I just really wanted them to know how grateful I am. And I've been thinking lately about writing them another letter to let them know the extraordinary life I've been able to lead these past several years because of their loved one. The ripple effect of good that has come from my two transplants is just beautiful. And having that opportunity to become a woman and fall in love and get married, all of those things that we just didn't even know if they were going to be possible. I think most importantly, I've learned the value of the quality of your life versus the quantity of it. Because there were a lot of times that I just wasn't sure how long my life would last. And now having all of these extra years, I'm putting all my energy into making them the best and having the best quality of time that I can while I'm still here. I'm so thankful for all of the challenges and the trials that I've been through because it's shaped me into who I am today. And I'm really proud to be a double transplant recipient and to have a connection with life and the meaning of it that I wouldn't have otherwise. My hope in sharing my stories is that other transplant recipients will see the joyful and fulfilling and productive life you can live post-transplant, show potential organ donors how grateful transplant recipients are and the opportunity they have to give someone else a second chance at life. Even though it takes some work and we go through some really, really challenging times, 
the other side is extraordinarily beautiful and it's so worth fighting for. This transformation into a new version of ourselves, one that appreciates life on a greater level than most others do. We come out with more than just the gift of life. We come out with gifts that I think only we can feel and experience. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Lawrence, and I do medical affairs for uh, transplant diagnostics, as well as being a practicing nephrologist. First of all, let me begin by congratulating Valen on the letter of hope, Dr. Series, which is an amazing achievement. It provides an in-depth insight into the day-to-day -day realities for transplant recipients, and I think it deserves another round of applause. For the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to be having a panel discussion. Uh, joining me will be Valen, of course, uh, Steve Bayreach, who produced the Letters of Hope uh, doctor series, Caden Hoven, who's here with his family, who's a three-time kidney transplant recipient, and Phil Shin, who's an LA local, who probably knows LA better than most of us, having pounded the streets of the LA Marathon not once but 11 times, who's also received a liver transplant from a friend, a living donor, and it hadn't stopped him running marathons. The panel's going to be moderated by my colleague Chris Petroski, but we'll be taking live questions from the floor and also online. Uh, but before we move on with that part of the conversation, I'd like to introduce Tom Moan, who would like to share some exciting news with us. Tom is the uh, Chief External Affairs Officer for One Legacy, which is the largest organ recovery organization in the United States. One Legacy serves more than 20 million people in Southern California. And since Tom arrived at One Legacy, organ donation has tripled. In 2021, One Legacy facilitated 1,688 life-changing, life-saving organ transplants. Please join me in welcoming Tom. Well, Alan, thank you. No, thank you for sharing your lives and stories with all of us, with the world, and with those who will live because you share your stories. You know, story storytelling underlies everything we do in donation and transplantation. Now, we know that most people going about their daily business would rather not think about organ donation. It's uh, when I first got to One Legacy, we were called the Southern California Organ Procurement Center. The first thing I did was get rid of the word organ and procurement. Then, but spoke to the more emotive part, the thing people really think about, which is the legacy, the legacy of life that goes on. But far too often, before hearing a good story, people think organ donation is about death and loss. But I can tell you, and I don't really need to tell anybody in this room, that transplant recipients and donor families know that it is not about the loss. It's about the legacy of life taking that first positive step forward of getting control back in your life and making something good come from an event that happened. It happened, but what did you do to make something good come out of it? And it's the stories that they tell and that, get, that we help share that opens up people's minds to realize the value of organ, eye, and tissue donation. At One Legacy, we've tried to create opportunities for people to share their stories because that's the only way we will change minds and save lives. The, to, meet, to reach the very largest populations, I think Alan talked about it very nicely there, we have our friends at the DMV. And the DMV are remarkable act, to tell you the truth, about sharing stories, inviting us to be there, to be present. And, but it all comes down to millions of people seeing a box they can check. Sometimes they're at the DMV, sometimes they're at home and doing it on the table, uh, getting it in the mail. 
but hopefully they've heard a story that inspired them to do this. Um, one of the, the biggest ways we get those stories out here in Southern California and across the nation is through the Donate Life float and the Rose Parade. When Legacy's put on this float for 20 years, is our 20th year coming up, and we very much welcome Thermo Fisher Scientific as a partner in this. And Ava's heart, our friend Ava is here as a partner in, in the Donate Life float this coming up this year. Um, it is a chance to get the stories from donor families, recipients, and professionals from across the country and around the world. We've had um, participants from Korea, from Japan, from China, from Europe, as well as pretty much all 50 states. And these, and these stories are told by donor families whose loved one is honored with a florograph on the float. They're told by riders who have received a life-saving transplant. They're told by walkers who donated, been living donors, donated a kidney or a piece of a liver or their recipients and prove that you can donate a, an organ, we get transplanted and wake up at five o'clock in the morning when it's 30 degrees in Pasadena, walk five and a half miles when it's 70 degrees or 80 degrees when you're done and live to tell about it, in fact, celebrate it and share that story. Last year, we uh, received 1.5 billion media impressions from the, the Rose Parade Donate Life float alone. So it is a way to get the stories out there to a very large world. Of course, we also use things like Donate Life Hollywood. Uh, which we have been, uh, we were doing some work on the other day, and we'll have the Donate Life Hollywood Inspire Awards coming up on the 25th of this month. If you want to go, let me know. Um, and they'll be held in Hollywood as they are, and we'll honor shows that tell the story right. The Resident uh, TV show actually produced probably the best episode of an organ donation ever done in any media. And Grey's Anatomy made up for all the crappy ones they did in the early years <laughs> before they met us. We, 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 we try to be helpful. We don't send too much flame mail. We mostly like to work with writers, producers, directors to get the story right, to know that the human story, the story that Valen tells, is far more dramatic than the kidney that's stolen out of the ambulance at the stoplight and transplanted in somebody's garage, because we know that happens every day. <laughs> so the, the, these are, you know, but that's a way to get stories at the mass and at the highest level and across the nation. At the end of the day, it's the personal stories of donors, donor family members, recipients. Uh, we and all of our organ procurement organization colleagues have ambassadors uh, who go out and share their stories around the communities at large. And these are, sometimes they may end up on the float and they may be uh, publicized in, in media. They may be stories of a, an um, honor walk at a hospital that actually got into a script of a TV show. And, and, uh, and uh, we thank the good doctor for that and a few others for the same sort of thing. But it's the personal story of an individual. Um, and our ambassadors are out at grassroots programs everywhere. We had a, ca a case recently, the first time we were back doing tabling at the Inglewood DMV, a largely African-American community with a large number of people waiting. And a gentleman walked by our table and saw the sign and said, one legacy or uh, donate life. And he said, I'm not going to be an organ donor because our people don't get transplants. One of our ambassadors at the table, who was also African-American, like the gentleman said, really? because I'm African-American, I'm your people, and I got a transplant. He said, really? He said, yeah. What'd you get? Well, I got a heart transplant, and she told her story. He said, well, I'm going to register. And 10 people in line joined him. Well, that's 11 registrations. It may not be the 18 million Californians who are registered, but that is a drop in the, that's those stories are drops in the pond that ripple. They ripple through families. They ripple through communities. And they ripple because they, uh, they ripple so strongly because they speak to that incredibly powerful emotion that is unique to our element, our work in the healthcare world. That place where the, uh, the raw emotions of loss of someone who's passed away uh, or in the potential life saving of someone who will pass away without that gift of life. And both of those events coming together at the one time. And the one thing that we know that comes out of that is caring, love, compassion, and gratitude. And I will tell you my experience of 22 years in organ donation, I'm not sure who's more grateful, recipients or donor family members. And if we can share those stories, we can end the 20 deaths on the wait list every year, every day, and we can help get the 106,000 people transplanted. And I will just uh, finish by saying I am, I personally and One Legacy is incredibly grateful to be partnering with Thermo Fisher Scientific and Valen to share these stories and get the message out uh, even more broadly in our world. So thank you very much for inviting me and allowing me to be a part of this. And again, Valen, thank you and congratulations on an amazing storytelling.
Inspire Awards, uh, that some of my colleagues at Inspire Awards do recognize uh, the TV shows, movies, and other storytelling opportunities in the media that promote and share the, the stories well and dramatically and inspirationally. And this year, Letter of the Post is going to be it, and some of my colleagues at Inspire Award winner. Congratulations. <laughs>Say that again. I can say that again. Yeah, because I thought it was just naturally loud. But my apologies. Um, yeah, I am very, very pleased to say that on August 25th um, at the Donate Life Hollywood Inspire Awards in Hollywood, where they should be, um, the Letters of Hope with Val and Kiefer, with the help of our friends at Thermo Fisher Scientific, is receiving a Donate Life Hollywood Inspire Award because what's more inspiring than what we've just witnessed? Thank you, Val, for being part of this. Thank you for making this happen. Uh, I'm Chris McCluskey, Director of Business Development for the Transplant Diagnostics Business Unit. I will be co-moderating our panel today, um, so let me introduce you. Chris has already given a nice introduction of uh, Valen, uh, the creator of the wonderful Letters of Hope docuseries. Valen, if you could please come to the stage, it would be great. I'd like to invite Drew Beirut, the producer of the series, to the stage. A little bit of background on Drew. He's an LA-based director, producer, and production company owner. His work is distinguished by its indie sensibility. These are Valen's words. And he says it's been an honor to work alongside Valen on the production of Letters of Hope. That wasn't my word. <laughs> please, please give Drew a warm round of applause. I'd like to invite Phil Shin to the stage. Phil is a husband, father, and serious runner from Southern California. He was diagnosed with a rare hepatocellular carcinoma in 2018 and has been cancer-free since undergoing transplant surgery in 2019. In spite of the health challenges he experienced, Phil never stopped running and believes his commitment to keep going is what helped him to continue living. Phil hopes we all find ways to keep living no matter what our health status may be. Please welcome Phil to the panel. I'd like to welcome Caden Hoven, who is a three-time renal transplant recipient who received his latest transplant in 2017, which has kept him healthy and thriving to the panel. Caden is passionate about educating the general public about issues affecting transplant recipients and those living with chronic disease. Please welcome Caden to the panel. Last but not least, I'd like to welcome Dr. Christopher Lawrence, a nephrologist and our Senior Director of Medical Affairs and Business Development to the panel. All right, so it's been a great screening. Um, Valen, I, I want to kick off with you. Um, the docuseries is entitled Letters of Hope, and in the first episode, you talk about the importance of finding hope, particularly when faced with a challenging diagnosis. Why do you think hope is such a critical part of the transplant journey? I think it's from my firsthand experience of having none to then experiencing what it feels like to have hope. So um, Caden holds a special place in my heart because when I was his age is when I had no hope and me sharing my story is striving to help individuals like himself and in his stage. And I think we just, whether just diagnosed or through the rest of our journey, we need that something to look forward to, something to hold on to because this isn't you get a transplant and you're good. This is a responsibility. Um, you know, a gift that comes with challenges, but I think when we have that perspective and we have the hope that we can see through other people's stories, and that's why I think it's important for all of us to share our experiences because we have that visual representation of what our lives can look like and that we're not alone, and I didn't have that when I was younger, and that's one of my missions of what I'm striving to do today. That's a really interesting response, and it brings me to, to Drew. Um, as the producer of the series, how did you and Valen come up with the concept of the docu-series? 
Um, and what, why did you think this was the right format to tell Valen's story? Yeah, I think as far as the format of doing it in a film, you know, um, a picture says a thousand words, but to me, I think a film says about a million. Um, it's just a way to really get across to people. And Valen is just so natural and elegant and powerful and radiant on camera that it's just something that is deeply impactful and I think will resonate with people. So we wanted to do uh, a film of some kind, but we also wanted it to be appropriate for whomever uh, would be watching, wherever they would be along the transplant journey. So that is why we've broken it up into 12 chapters, 12 different letters. And it's meant so that wherever you are in your trajectory, in your life story, um, you can start wherever it feels appropriate, wherever you're comfortable. And some people can do the Netflix thing and binge it all if they like, like we just did. Thank you all for doing that, by the way. Um, but that was kind of the thought behind it. Great. Valen, how did you how did you come up with the content for the series? Through my lived experience, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like I tried to think of how to take this huge journey and break it down to main topics. Of course, we could address a lot more, and hopefully, we will in future projects. But um, trying to take these different stages and um, it came together really naturally. Actually storyboarded it in a couple weeks. And my husband had said to me, You this is your life. You don't it's not like I needed to practice or study it. And I just really wanted to share that authentic journey so it would come across as patient to patient, so that it just felt like you're watching it and you're in the living room with your friend or somebody, and it it had that feel to it of patient to patient support because I've seen the impact of that, the weight that is lifted off of somebody's shoulders. My very first speaking engagement, the people that came up afterwards and was like, oh my gosh, me too, or my dad this, or my mom that, and just seeing that them looking at somebody that has gone through what they've been through or what they're about to go through, just the weight it took off of their shoulders. So I really wanted to try and um, break this journey down and make it in a um, kind of an easy to digest way. Um, I've gotten through this by taking it one day and one step at a time. So I wanted to take that approach when I did the storyboarding of it. And it was really important to me to bring along the caregivers in this journey because I just always go back to thinking at transplant evaluation, the only thing that's in bold and underlined print is that I couldn't go through evaluation without a caregiver. It's like, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my caregivers. I wanted to bring that to light. And I also wanted the opportunity when assembling the topics is addressing things that I wanted to bring to light that I don't think are talked about enough. Either there just aren't necessarily comfortable maybe conversations for people with dating and family planning. And also mental health is really important to me. And I was really grateful to be able to discuss that and bring it out in the open. Well, that, that brings us to my next question, which is about finding your voice. So, Caden, this one's for you. In the second episode of the series, Valen talks about the process of finding her voice at, at, after her first transplant at 19 and how it led her to discover this passion for writing. We know from previous conversations and town halls with you that you have a deep passion for movies. In fact, you and I share a favorite movie in Almost Famous, which I think is amazing. <laughs> Um, my question is, how have you sort of come around to finding your own voice and what role has transplantation played in that process? Well, ever since I was young, my parents were the caregivers. So a question was asked and they gave the answer because I didn't really speak up for myself. And with time, I eventually learned how to speak up for myself because not only did I feel that I should, but I also felt that I needed to, especially because I'm going to college in a few years. I will be leaving home, so I'll have to take care of myself and know how to do that, just like I need to know how to do all my medications, book appointments. It's just more something I had to gradually learn, but once I got the hang of it, I start doing it all the time. Even tomorrow I have a doctor's appointment, and I plan on talking the whole time. <laughs> That's wonderful. 
Valen, you dedicated a whole segment of the series to the importance of advocating yourself in line with, with Caden's response here and shared your story of persistently requesting a PET scan to identify the cause of repeated sepsis mm -hmm. infections when your care providers told you it was an unnecessary test. As we saw from the screening, you ended up being right. As a patient, why is it important to trust your instincts? Also, how do you remain firm in your convictions in situations like that? That can be really tough. I, we know our bodies, we know our health history better than anyone. And I've experienced so many times of going to the hospital and needing to speak up because either the nurse said, oh, so you, you, you got two kidneys when you got your transplant. And I'm like, no, you only get one. So you realize the education that you have to provide to the people caring for you. And sometimes that's really scary. The other thing that's challenging is you're severely ill and having to find that strength to advocate for yourself. So I've tried to help myself by, I have a very detailed spreadsheet because when I would get sepsis, I'd have rigors and a fever, I'd feel awful. Sometimes I was even by myself when I called 911 and they came to the house and I had something to hand them tangible with all of my information knowing that during those situations, I may be too weak to even tell them all of that. So um, there have been so many times that I have had to do that. It's made a huge difference, but it is hard to, to almost get the confidence to do that. It, it makes me think of with my back and scoliosis, I can't lift heavy things. And I have to ask for help while traveling for people to get my luggage off the carousel. And that sometimes you're just like, you have that pause where I'm like, okay, you can do it, just ask. You kind of just need to like almost encourage yourself and I still even have to today, but I have witnessed time and time again that there's been moments that it's even saved my life. So it's so important for us to understand this is our journey, it's really important we speak up and just, um, just trying to almost like support ourselves and knowing that that's the right decision and, and there's been times where I've just really had to try and encourage other people to get on board and and you know, and trust me, you know. Totally I understand. And Phil and Caden, I would love to hear more about your experiences. I mean, it would be great if you could share sort of an example of how you've advocated yourself and some of the challenges that you face when when having to be your own best advocate. Um. Okay. Story time. Um. About two or three months ago, I went in for my normal infusion. And I walk in and there's a nurse that I haven't had before. So I'm like, okay, nothing out of the blue. It's just someone new. So they may not know things exactly how I do them. We go through the normal uh, blood pressure, checking weight, checking height. And I'm like, okay, everything's going great. And then she goes to draw my labs. And usually you use the needle in the arm to do um, grab vials. She decided to use a syringe and I'm like, not the best idea, but okay. She drew maybe um, a vial and a half less than she would need it to. So I'm like, okay, that's worrisome. And then the next medication I needed, Alisher, she drew about 10 to 20 minutes late, and it was with even less blood. So I'm like, not going great. Infusion when um, she wanted to do pre-meds before, and I'm like, no. Um, sorry, I mean before we did the pre-med IV. And in the end, I eventually emailed my doctor and I'm like, these things didn't seem right, so I don't know if the medication is gonna come back. He emailed me later, he's like, Caden, you were completely right. If anything like that happens again, here's my number, you contact me. It's really impressive, thank, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Of course, thank you. Phil. Yeah, I, uh, I have one that was actually quite frightening and very frustrating. Um, while we're going through this journey of waiting for your donor, in my case, I knew that my only option was a living liver donor uh, transplant. So we knew that we had a number of people who submitted themselves. So we're just going through the process of just waiting. And I shouldn't just say just the process, because it's agonizing, absolutely agonizing, because you have no idea when you're going to get that call. Um, it wasn't until. <laughs> I, I had always expected that my transplant coordinator would contact me and say, hey, you're, we've matched, we found your match and uh, you're gonna be scheduled for surgery this day. That never happened. Um, what, what eventually ended up happening was that one of my dear friends of over 20 years, he sent me a text um, saying, hey, 
um, what's the latest with your liver donor situation? And kind of random because, you know, we're, we're good friends, but we never really got deep into, you know, my health uh, issues. I knew he cared, but <laughs> I said, I don't know. It's great that you're asking, but I have no idea what the status of my uh, donor is. And he responded, well, that's funny because I was told that I wasn't allowed to let you know until they told you. <laughs> and I was confused because this is the first time we ever talked about my transplant. And I just responded, what are you talking about? And then he responded, I'm your donor. <laughs> I said, wait, I, I, I dropped the phone. I was I obviously just went through the full gamut of emotions. But then I just realized, wait, I thought my transplant team was supposed to contact me. Well, it turned out that he had been told that he was going to be my match for well over a week. And they had, his team had thought that my team was going to contact me. And my team thought that his team was going to contact me. That's when we just said, you know what? We're going to own this. We're going to drive this. We're going to tell you, look, we have connected. This is when we want the transplant. We established the date. And we said, you guys need to clear your calendars and make sure that we can get transplanted. And that's when we just take full ownership of the entire process. right? But again, it was just one of those things where had he not you know, been as proactive as to send me this. Because he was also thinking, well, maybe I'm not the guy, maybe I'm the second guy. So, but he he was also agonizing in this way because he wasn't getting any information. So he found the courage to just reach out to me directly and let me know, look, I'm your donor. And yeah, so if it weren't for that, who knows, we could still be waiting right now. Wow. <laughs> Talk about a fragmented healthcare system. <laughs> Chris, <laughs> as a nephrologist treating uh, transplant recipients, how do you incorporate patients' expressed needs, concerns, and preferences into your medical practice? So, a good question, Chris. I was wondering what you were going to ask me. Um, remembering that it's mid -year. He had these in advance, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I should read my emails more carefully. Uh, so I, you know, I, I would, um, I was reflecting on what I would think with uh, Valen as my patient, and uh, I, I was thinking that no matter how demanding Valen could be, and I imagine she could be quite demanding, I'd much rather have the full engagement from uh, somebody that I was working with. Uh, than somebody who doesn't come to clinic, who doesn't do their labs, who doesn't take their tablets. And so what uh, Valen's done here by taking control of her own health care and by advocating for herself and by others is really helping that enormously. I think the approach that, you know, that what I call it is shared care. Um, I've seen a lot of different approaches to health care. I've seen people telling doctors what to, I've seen doctors telling patients what to do and not explaining why and then wondering why they don't do it. And I think it's pretty obvious. You know, why would you do something if you don't understand why you're doing it? And so my approach has always been to have a discussion and um, at the end of the day, the patient's, you know, in charge. They don't have to agree with the health advice that you give. What I've found, though, is that as long as you're able to have a conversation, who's that? You can. Um, as long as you're able to have a conversation and explain why the advice is the advice that it is and go through the options, uh, then usually you can find an, an accord that's uh, you know, the, the right path. And the other thing I would say is that there's, it's never usually the case that there's only one right way to do things. There's usually a way to accommodate people's preferences or needs and still arrive at the right destination. Thank, thank you for that response. Uh, Phil, I had a question for you just to talk about the fact that you had um, a very rare procedure. Um, there were more than 9,200 liver transplants performed in the US last year, but only five of these were from uh, living donors. 
I wanted to ask you about your experience of being worked up, but you already um, shared a bit of that process for us. If you'd like to go into a little bit more detail around that, I think it would be relevant because I don't think a lot of people understand the dynamics or the workup around living liver donation as it compares to kidney. So maybe perhaps talking um, at, some, uh, at some length about that would be helpful for the room and those online. Yeah, no, thanks, Chris. I appreciate you creating some space to let me talk about because I, I, I do feel that um, there's a fairly gross lack of education when it comes to the opportunity to do, be a live liver donor. So um, I'll confess I had no idea either. Um, I thought my only option was a deceased donor. Um, but when um, I went into the transplant clinic and they informed me that I had to receive a liver transplant, they looked at me, I had actually just, I, I had already had a previous liver resection six months prior, um, but my cancer returned. And in that six months, I had actually gone in and run another marathon. <laughs> and um, super Amazing. grateful that I was able to, yeah. yeah. But um, my health was actually a detriment to where I was listed. Um, I was actually at the bottom of the list, my MELD score came in at six, which is the equivalent of just writing your name on the SAT. And for those who don't yes, know right. in the room, the highest <laughs> is 40, and the closer you are to 40, the more likely you are to be transplanted. Right, right. So when I went in, they just said, look, best case, um, you're probably looking at three years before you can realistically receive uh, a deceased liver uh, donation and or deceased liver transplant. Well. I had cancer, right, and the liver being a vascular organ, obviously there's high risk by just sitting there and waiting for three years. So um, that's when they shared with me that, oh, you actually have an option for a living liver uh, transplant. And that's when they educated us where on my side as a recipient, the process is the same, deceased or living, you're, you're listed and you wait, right, and you, you go through the protocols of coming into clinic, getting a value, just making sure that your liver stays stable. And again, because I was a runner, I was fairly healthy, that wasn't really a concern. It was really just, you got cancer, we need to make sure that the cancer doesn't spread elsewhere. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we had to send out a communication to our network of family, friends, and my colleagues to see if anybody would be interested in becoming my donor. So we. At that point, I kept my diagnosis fairly private. So that email that was actually sent by my sister, because I just didn't have the courage or the strength to send that out myself. I, I joke that, you know, it's not like you're asking for $20 from someone to borrow $20. And for myself, I get very uncomfortable just asking for someone to pay me back the $20. So to actually push out a note to say, would you mind carving some time in your calendar to be my donor. It just, I couldn't do it. So my sister just took full ownership of that and pushed it out. So a lot of people, they were just shocked that I had cancer because me as a runner and being fairly healthy, this is just not what they had expected. So later down, we had found out that there were 16 people actually submitted themselves to be my donor. And that process is, uh, there's an online evaluation tied to my transplant clinic. And my transplant clinic is uh, Keck Medical Center of USC. <clears throat> And they would simply just name me as the recipient and then go through a very long uh, online questionnaire that evaluates their physical health, but more importantly, their mental and their um, psychological health, because those are the factors that I believe weigh most in the evaluation, because they want to eliminate any risk of this person backing out. And of course, they have every opportunity to back out, even up to the point of surgery. So, so that, was, that was just uh, on my side, absolutely agonizing, because we're just waiting. Meanwhile, um, on, the, uh, uh, on the side of the folks who are interested in becoming my donor, they're also kind of in the dark, right? So they submit individually, and they are essentially ranked based on their health, their age, and their general, um, uh, I think it's health, age, and blood type. So, so based on that, everybody's ranked. And my donor actually ranked at the very top, and <laughs> he, never, he never backed out. He, he, he stayed committed, and on his side, 
the logistics of it, I was explaining to Chris, was just enormously challenging for him because one, they are discouraged from disclosing themselves as my donor to me. So I'm being handled by my team, he's being handled by a completely separate team. But logistically, it was extremely challenging for him because he lived in Portland, I was here in Los Angeles. So it wasn't just, okay, drop my name in the hat and then just call me when we can have the surgery. No, they actually had to fly him back down like three times to get uh, medically evaluated and psychologically evaluated. And in addition to that, it's, again, it's the psychological and the mental evaluation that weighs the heaviest because every single time he was in communication with them, whether it was in person, on the phone, or through an email, it was like, are you sure you want to do this, right? You, you know, you can die, you, you, know, you know, things, bad things can, you know, happen and things can go wrong. And it got to the point, and even on the day of the surgery, when I got rolled in, right, uh, for transplant, they rolled Mark in right next to me, and I heard them again ask him, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> and, because again, he has every right to back out, right? So, but no, he said, I am here to save my friend Phil's life, so let's get this done. So, um, but for him, and I just get emotional thinking about how the conviction that he displayed from day one of hitting submit on that online questionnaire, to booking flights out of his own pocket, to coming down, booking his own accommodation, without telling me once that this is happening, it, he's a hero. <laughs> I mean, he, well, he's a hero. If there was ever a call to action to make organ donation living easier, I mean, this is, this is the story to tell. So thank you so much for, for sharing that experience. I think it was really illuminating for all of us in the room. Um, Valen. There's a moment of great vulnerability in the series where you acknowledge that it's sometimes difficult to ask for your caregiver's support. Uh, how do you combat this instinct and speak up for help when you need it? I'm still struggling with it. It's a really hard thing to do because as your health deteriorates, you see how everybody else has to chip in and do things and all you want to do is to lead a normal life. and just coming to grips with your health getting worse and then just feeling that guilt of you know we're you know i'm almost 40 but you know we're a younger couple and to think that this is the life that noah is living because of my health issues and it's been um just something really hard but i think the biggest lesson that noah has taught me is that if i don't ask for help it's likely going to make the situation worse you know it's like I need to just learn to accept it and, and that will not make things so challenging because if I push myself and don't accept help, then I'll likely be dealing with a bigger issue and then that's not good on him either. But um, it's been interesting dynamics between my parents being my caregivers and then going towards my husband being a caregiver because a lot of times growing up, I just kept things to myself and wouldn't tell my parents because I saw the stress that it put on them. And my husband has been able to handle things differently than you know they could. But I remember I would be really sick and not tell my parents and just drive myself to the emergency room because I knew the stress it would put on them. But then in turn, that's not good for me. There's just so many dynamics that really need to be discussed and out in the open between you know caregivers and the long-term impact on it. and. Um, and it's just tough to be vulnerable and just, you know, understand that this is the situation. Um, but Noah's really encouraged me to really understand that it's helping the broader picture if I can just ask for help. But I feel like I need advice on that. <laughs> well, I think your honesty was tremendous. And I loved how you referred to the idea of you, like we are getting a liver transplant. Oh I mean, gosh. that was a, a yeah. really emotional moment for me watching the series because yeah. I could feel that. And, yeah. you know, I think you have to view it that way. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's incredible that you've really built this team dynamic. And I think it's mm -hmm. a, a critical part of your journey and your, your journey to wellness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Drew, I want to turn to you for a moment. Um, the segment on the wait list is such a powerful one. You managed to capture the feelings of anxiety and stasis that accompany the wait, lit, the wait for a life-saving organ, as well as the feelings of gratitude and survivor's guilt that can come with finding a match. As a documentary filmmaker, how do you achieve these moments of emotional truth? Sorry, Noah, I can't see you. 
I think right Siri, Siri might have some input from the second <laughs> row over there. Um, it's a great question, Chris. Um, I think we wanted to do in the middle of this anthology and at the end something that was a departure from the setting of the rest, which was, you know, for the most part, this is Valen's home. It's very personal, it's very intimate, it's very her, and by design, it was very comfortable. Um, and that was helpful always for, you know, it also helps to have a relationship, which we already had before this project, um, to be comfortable in an interview setting. Um, for topic and letter six through, and 12, six and 12, um, we did something different because it was our third day shooting together. We felt like we had some momentum and we wanted to take a little bit of a risk. Um, as you could see, it was like a green screen studio kind of thing instead. And we just wanted to get clever on which topics could be best captured in that way. And when Valen would tell me her story of being on the wait list is like being in this void like prison and being in the dark and being in this gray area of waiting, I was like, okay, I think she's ready to do something that actually does feel by design a little bit more isolated. And then there she was, she executed it perfectly. And we, we did an interview very well in that context. Um, so that was kind of the idea with topic six, uh, the wait list. I mean, it, re it really came through to, to the viewer. And, and that sort of moves me along to the segment um, around living life immunosuppressed and how important it is to establish a, a new normal to control risk of infection, malignancy, comorbidity. I'm putting this out there to all of the transplant recipients on, on the panel. To what extent did the pandemic impact your new normal? Kaden, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, well, first off, I like to think that it made me more cognizant, like wearing a mask. People have started doing it because of the pandemic. But I think, like, germs have always been around and diseases have always been around. I just think it made people more aware, just like this hopefully will make people more aware of transplantation. It made us more aware of what is out there, what can affect us what danger the world holds for our immune systems. And I think it made people that are immunocompromised even more scared because our, when we suffer, it's greater than when people that have less health, health risks um, deal with it. Phil, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, it was, it's really interesting. Um, by the time the pandemic had hit, I was, six months post-transplant, and I, you know, we had established protocols with our family and friends, anybody who wanted to come and visit, that they had to be masked. We actually made them wear latex gloves also. I don't know why we did that, but we, <laughs> we said, you need to be gloved up, and uh, we had sanitizer everywhere. And then when the steel gate of the pandemic dropped, I was like, wow, welcome to my world, folks. <laughs> so, um, but what was really enormous for me was just noticing I, my community, they were so vigilant to protect me once the pandemic happened. Every time we wanted to, whether it was just come outside and say hello or get together in a, you know, a nice space group setting, they thought of me first. Okay, what accommodations do we need to make for Phil for us to do this? And that was just really, really touching to see that and the fact that they are already kind of like pre-educated based on their engagement with me over the previous six months it just felt like my community my people they were they were very prepared for the pandemic and incorporating you know all these safety measures for them to live their lives and they continue to do so to this day so i was very grateful for that it's, in, it's incredible to have that support valen i'd love to hear your thoughts on this Sure. So there were, like you said, Phil, it's almost like the rest of the world is getting a bit of a taste of our world. There were some things that was very common, like wearing masks and washing our hands. We don't need educated on any of that. So that was normal to us, but it was absolutely terrifying for the community because when you have a suppressed immune system, you respond differently. We can get severely ill from a cold. If I'm vomiting, I can't keep my medicine down, it's going to the emergency room. A fever is emergency room right away because that's different for us than a normal person. And 
this was all new, so there wasn't a lot of information, and it was really hard for our community because they didn't have a place to go to understand this. We had no direction of what to do, and still to this day, our transplant community, we're receiving different information from our doctors, and we talk to each other and have no idea what we should do then. And so that's been really challenging. Um, I was a part, I still am a part of a research study to test the effectiveness and durability of the vaccine. And that was something that was really concerning for our community because we weren't a part of the studies. So we didn't know how we would respond, if it would be safe. So being a part of that was the only place that I was getting reliable information from. And still to this day, like I think as transplant recipients, we just have to be adaptable, <laughs> you know, even, you know, well before COVID. And that's something that we have to continue to have to do. I was telling Chris that um, through recent trips with Thermo Fisher is just my first sort of exposure to broad audiences and more people. But I'm still, like I did a recent trip with them and then I go home and I live really careful and secluded and now all of a sudden I'm like out in the world and I'll go back and live really secluded. I get the getting these weird, you know, kind of experiences. But even on trips, I'm not responding like traveling like a normal person. My goal is to be able to do the engagement healthy and get home healthy. So yesterday I stayed safe in my room. I ordered dinner in. I'm here masked and hope to just get home safe and celebrate my 20th anniversary. <laughs> you know, it's like it, our lives are constantly um, different than others, but that's why I think it's important to talk about it so we can normalize our experiences. Well, speaking of seclusion and isolation, I think all of us in the room can attest to the impact of two years of quarantine and social distancing and the strain it's put on our mental health. Mm -hmm. We know that incidence of depression and anxiety is up, and I'm curious, you know, you talked about in the documentary, that as a transplant recipient, there's a lot of focus on your physical health and managing yourself physically, but that often comes at the neglect of mental well-being. So what are some things that you do to make sure that you're checked into your, you know, mental state and that you're, you're not just managing your physical health, but you're keeping yourself strong and mentally well? I think that's an area that's really lacking support for our community. And we're like during transplant evaluation when we're dealing with so much and being so sick that unfortunately some things can get pushed to the side if we don't have easy resources or it's not easily accessible to us and I think that's one of the aspects because we're navigating so much and while that should be at the top of the list if we don't have means to be able to get the support and help then that unfortunately might not happen. I feel like for my overall mental well-being, it's not one thing, it's a combination of things. I'm fortunate to have a really good support system. I think being passionate about something is really important and my patient advocacy fills that. And I also think having um, a healthy outlet, kind of like Caden talks about movies and for me writing and doing something to channel what we've been through. I really believe that talking about things has been really helpful for me because it helps to try and process it and you know create something meaningful from all that I've been through because this is really traumatic experiences for both the recipients and the family at large so I think it's really important for us not to hold things in I did that all through my youth until my 20s and realized, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't talk about anything. And so I really hope to encourage other people to find outlets and other people and just really, you know, positive ways to be able to get what we've been through out. And kind of like I shared in the video is that doesn't have to be up here on stage like we're doing. It can be, you know, something like artwork or something quiet like watching a movie or writing. I just think it's important that we bring this topic to light, hopefully be able to provide more resources and that it's something that is like preventative care, not something that we're doing after the fact of going through everything. I'd love for it to be that you find out you need a transplant and that's immediately part of the process and support that you're given. So I wanna talk about uh, health hiccups and, with respect to preventive care. And, and this again is posed to the three transplant recipients and we'll start with you, Kaden, and work our way uh, down back to Valen. How do you prepare yourself for the inevitable health hiccup, hiccup physically, mentally? 
what are some things that you consider? Um, first off, I know there's always going to be health hiccups, so it's not like I'm naive to them. I know they're coming. I just don't know when. Um, I try to prevent myself by staying on top of my meds, which I'm not always the best at, which I need to get better at. Um, uh, I go to my doctor's appointments. I try to listen so that I know what like my lab levels are. Um, I try to understand my condition and like, uh, I bought Grey's Anatomy, the book, cause I'm like, I'll look up creatinine and, and they'll give me a more, a better definition than the internet will. And just looking up the terms helps me understand better. That's great. Phil? Yeah, this is a tricky one. Um, cause you asked for both mental and physical and I think on the physical side, it really is just maintaining that level of vigilance and self-advocacy. So if you're not feeling well or um, uh, I'm not sure why they allow the patients to see the lab results before your doctor, but sometimes I'll take a peek and I'll see you know something in the red saying that I've, I've reached an elevated level of something or other. Um, being able to pinpoint that and call it out and speak to my transplant team immediately about it. Uh, I think that's critical because it's your transplant team and your primary care physician who's gonna kind of talk you down from that ledge. So um, doing that and having an open, honest uh, conversation, not only with your medical team, but also with your family is super helpful, as well as with your community. Cause it's also helpful for me to like reach out to my transplant community to see, hey, have you had this experience? And being able to bounce those experiences together. On the mental side, I become, <laughs> I, I, I feel like I could teach a master class on reframing. So um, I'm constantly battling through every mental challenge that Bellin beautifully expressed in the, um, uh, in the documentary. Survivor's guilt um, is a big one for me. Um, I'm sure Bellin and Caden can probably um, attest to the challenges of having, being so open and vulnerable, um, you make these connections and they're beautiful connections, but oftentimes uh, these people, they don't see the same outcomes as we have and I have to deal with that. I'm honored to carry that weight of what they're experiencing, but it's weight, right? So having to navigate through the mental and emotional challenges that come with that is, it's, it's still challenging. I don't have an answer other than working with Valen and the transplant community to um, find ways we can navigate through this together because it is a shared experience. Thank you. Valen? It amazes me that the metrics for transplant is one year after transplant and seeing how well people are doing and just the we're not actually, um, we're not just data, we're human beings and we're not at, often asked how we are. Like it amazes me that I've gone back for clinic and they look at my numbers and you look great, get out there and live your life. There's so much more to that. And nobody actually asked me how I'm doing. Like not just how I'm feeling physically, how am I doing? And if we did that more often, we'd understand more and then we'd know what resources are provided. And maybe if we had more education, like Caden said, on taking medicine and why it's important, then maybe transplants would even last longer because we were more empowered. You know, I think it would be amazing at like six months or a year, they'd ask, you know, at appointments on like, how are you doing with your medicine? You know, do you understand all that you're taking? Do you have any questions? Even ask the person to let them know what medicine they're taking. Um, there's just so much to this that to me, it's, it's like, how can we, how can we think that we're just going to face death and then just be okay and integrate back into society and be normal? Like, there's just so much, like Phil said and Caden, um, for health hiccups, it's a heavy weight to know that there's always going to be something else that will come next. That's really hard when I was getting daily IV antibiotics and needed a transplant, every day I wondered if I'd wake up and have sepsis again. Like that's a huge thing to always have on your mind of like, okay, I feel great now, but 
when's that going to fall off, that type of thing. So the importance of trying to be present and not think too much big picture and just today and all of those different lessons, like those are things that, that like there, sh there should be programs and, and opportunities to be able to help patients. Um, they, never, they never get easier. You know? Well, I think that segues nicely into my, my final question, and then we'll open it up briefly to the, the audience here. So I think it's really poignant that you chose to conclude the documentary by honoring your donors. And I want to ask this to everybody on the panel. Um, what do you think that we can do as Thermo Fisher to help raise the profile around the importance of organ donation and the importance of improving longer term uh, transplant outcomes? I'll start with Chris, and then we'll work our way back down to you, Valen. Well, I think um, the most important thing that we can do is help to amplify the remaining challenges in transplantation. Um, we, you, you know, you and I have often talked about where we see the gaps in transplant diagnostics and in particularly in post-transplant care, which is an area that you and I are particularly um, interested in. And obviously, TDX has got a huge um, sort of investment and legacy in the pre-transplant matching and tissue typing and antibody detection side of things already. And our direction of travel has been to continue to support and improve that whilst developing new products and new advances in post-transplant care. Um, and I think that, um, the, the, hopefully, the contributions that we're making to diagnostics will help with the uh, question of long-term graft survival. But I don't think you can do that just with, you know, a magic tablet or a magic diagnostic. I think the, you know, the, the advocacy that we're embarking on We've, we've always put the patients at the center of everything we do at One Lambda, transplant diagnostics, but I think having a more formal program, engaging with the, uh, with, with the OPOs, engaging with the transplant community, um, engaging with policymakers, and just continuing to work together as one community, one step at a time, advancing the needle a bit by bit, and improving the experience of transplantation and, th and through that, hopefully improving outcomes. And I think, I think Valen hit the nail on the head there. As I've often said, what, what, why would people be interested in what your one-year graft survival is or your five-year graft survival? What you want to know is how are you going to be in 20 years' time? You know, what sort of life are you going to lead? You know, what's it going to be like? How are you going to do things that are going to improve your experience of life and how you know, rather than just a metric rather than just a, a, a dot on a chart you know that, that i think is something that we should all work towards agreed kaden would love to hear your thoughts i don't have that much to say as much as that <laughs> that's okay i think engaging and informing um not just adults but especially teenagers who are starting to get their licenses and can click the box and be like, yes, I want to be an organ donor if something should happen to me. I think that is really important because there's millions of teens out there driving and it increases every year. So I know how terrible this is, but that means there's more people that are organ donors. So if something happens to them, there's more organs that can be used for transplantation. And I think also not just having them check the box, but also knowing like the lives that they will impact if something should happen to them and the life that can be lived if they get an organ. That's a really profound, well-considered response. Thank you. Thank you. Phil. Um, I think we all know that um, organ transplantation, it's, it's not new. It's been around for decades. Um, obviously, the technology and the medicine has been elevated thanks to time and investment. But I really do think that it's education. And obviously, anybody can pick up a pamphlet or a leaflet and read that, oh, hey, you should become an organ donor because you have an opportunity to save up to eight lives. We all know that. But 
there's something about the power of voice and the power of story with that voice that really lays the foundation. It's that connective tissue where people connect. And that's when you spur meaningful education, right? Because so many people can't have come to me and say, look, I had no idea that I can donate a part of my liver, right? And I'm not, you know, and they're saying, look, maybe I, I can't do it, but now I, have, now I have the education because I know your story. I know Valen's story. I know Caden's story. So because of that, I can now see someone's need and draw a connection and say, there's an opportunity here where someone can actually save your life. And we, if we can continue to create these amazing partnerships with One Legacy and with, with Thermos Fisher, it, I think we can get there. Because again, I, transplant, it's not new. It's been around for a long time. But I think it's just by expanding that education and really just that connection, that human connection, that's how we can get there. Yeah, there seems to be a theme in the responses about you know, incorporating the transplant community voice into the story, storytelling, education. I think that that's really critical. Drew, your thoughts on this? Yeah, exactly. My response is really similar, actually. I think Thermo Fisher could really continue to help with this cause by just broadening the aperture of the spotlight on stories like Valens. Um, I think you can really turn ripples into waves when you make it um, more than just spotlighting one person, but having Valen be sort of the, uh, the leader in opening it to a much larger community, getting people who are uh, also comfortable on camera to impart their, their tales and their stories and just make this all feel um, something that you pointed out that has been going on for decades, but is sort of left in the dark still in a lot of ways, all make it feel more familiar, normal, and something that is absolutely needed. And um, that would be my hope going forward, that we can just do a little bit more and make it more about the entire community to broaden it. Yeah. And Valen, obviously we want to conclude with you, given that I know this is your mission and you have oh. some really profound things to say about it. Oh, thank you. Um, I've spoken to high school students before, so I wholeheartedly agree with what you said, Caden. I love our community. It's important for us to gather together, but we need to figure out how to get outside of our community for education. Um, and we can do that by creating really amazing, impactful projects that are going to be shared beyond our community. Speaking to high school students, I, I mean, I think back in high school, I didn't understand organ donation. So how do we educate them? How do we also make this a, an OK common conversation for at home? that families can talk about this. Families that don't have any personal connection to organ donation, but they saw a video, they saw our series or docu-series, it encouraged them to have the conversation, and then they're making educated decisions. And by doing that, they need to see the visual representation of the impact that their decision will make. And I think we can do that through storytelling. I. There's the deceased donation and then the living donation. So by the education, we're encouraging um, deceased side to check yes for organ donation. But something that's been on my heart is the living donation side. So I'll be celebrating 20 years this weekend. Harold, how many years for you? 22 oh, congratulations, years. Congratulations, Harold. Harold is a living kidney donor. And um, I want to tell stories like Harold's. I want to tell stories of people that are far out from living donation so that we can hear the impact it's had on their life. It gives me goosebumps because I feel like you see videos of a donor meeting a recipient shortly after and it's amazing. But let's talk to them years after so it could be like, Harold, how has this impacted your life? 22 years. And then all of a sudden the viewer will be like, oh my gosh, I have the opportunity to do that. So we need to see, yes, the impact on recipients, the amazing life we can live. And like I said, I wanna, I wanna show how rich it makes our lives. Yes, we have a lot to deal with, but we're different changed people in a beautiful way. And so I'd love to share a different side of living donation that we haven't heard yet. And I know of people that are on dialysis and aren't educated on transplantation. 
I know people that are scared of taking immunosuppression medicine because they're not sure what their life will be like. Those are the people that we need to educate, and we will have an incredible impact if we can reach these different audiences. And I know we can do this meaningful work. I, I completely agree. And you know, we at Thermo Fisher are not just committed to telling the stories of transplant recipients, but also the donors, particularly the living donors who have supported access to transplantation. So you have our commitment to amplifying that voice. And on that note, Valen, we would love to congratulate you. I know Nicole wants to say a few words to wrap us up on your 20th year anniversary, which is really a major milestone. Valen, just on behalf of everyone in this room, online, and all the people that you have touched with your story, we just want to celebrate your anniversary and just say thank you, thank you. You are truly an inspiration, and I just feel honored to have the opportunity that our paths cross. So. Everyone, um, we're running up against time. I don't know if anyone in the room has like critical questions they'd like to ask of Valen. Um, we have a prop, about five minutes. We also have some light refreshments here and out, out in the foyer. You can grab them. You know, uh, We have the space until 5.30. So does anybody in the room have a question? Jen? No. I'm not really good with mics. Uh, thank you for being here. All of your stories are really inspiring. So just. One thought, as a medical device manufacturer, um, how could we help you? I know you guys say that you don't like to ask for help. It makes you uncomfortable. But if you can say, this is what we need right now from what we can do and give or amplify, what would it be? I think, first off, the less scarring, the better. So if a biopsy can be less invasive, um, such as I had a biopsy in which a special needle was brought out and it was so small that there was barely any mark left. And that was just the best because it was the least painful biopsy I've ever had. And I still remember it because of that. So if you can keep making stuff that improves medical technology to make it less evasive, then that would be amazing. Um, really good question. <laughs> I don't know why, but when I was uh, recovering from my transplant, I remember just trying to get breathing again, and I still have just sweaty nightmares about that spirometer that I had to breathe in. So, <laughs> um, but that's obviously unnecessary. But um, if there's a way that we could somehow streamline and simplify the lab draw, I'm still going in um, every other month for lab draws, and I, it's it's it never gets easier. It honestly doesn't, and um, I, I'm not expecting uh, you know major breakthroughs on that. That doesn't involve like fraud like Theranos, but you know at some point I would love to see a much more simpler way to to draw your labs. Injections of infusions would also be great. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've gotten labs done at least once a month for the past 20 years, and it's amazing the stress that still comes with it. Like, I get the email for the results, and I literally am like, okay. It's like, these numbers need to be good, and if they're not good, my whole day is going to totally change, and my doctor's going to call, and then something's going to happen, and this is the spiral of mental things that go through our mind. And then it's amazing because when I see the good numbers, I instantly scan to creatinine and ALT for kidney and liver. They're good. And I'm like, okay, now I can slowly go through all the rest. <laughs> it's just like, you know, it's just so much stress surrounding it. But when I've been a part of this um, research study during COVID, they, I take my own blood from home. So I know that we can't do that for labs that requires a lot of tubes. But making it so easily accessible for me to do that and again, it was almost an empowerment. I was excited. It's like, well, I can do this myself. And um, I was able to package it up, and they picked it up on my front doorstep. It kept me completely safe during the heightened time of COVID that I didn't need to go out. And I think if we can streamline things and make them a bit easier so that we can incorporate them and feel like we live more of a normal life, because we want to have the best quality, the most kind of normal life of we can work full time and do all these things. So if, if it cannot feel like tests and things like that 
take up so much of our time and feeling just different than other people, I think just um, that would be helpful, kind of like the urine test right now, but um, instead of doing like biopsies, things like that. Because my experience with the liver biopsy was extremely traumatic, so I agree with that type of thing. So I think just, um, just making things a little bit easier for us in the form of testing, uh, I think would be really helpful. Well, thank you everybody for coming. We really appreciate your time and attention and commitment to the transplant community. Please feel free to uh, take some light refreshments. You know, some of us will be around for Q&A. If you want to grab us and chat, we're more than happy to stay until 530. And again, we really appreciate you being here and supporting Letters of Hope. So thank you.